Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin panel discussion one on policies and platforms supporting the transition to a circular economy. I invite Mr. Shank to moderate the discussion. Thank you, Madam President. Good afternoon. Thanks for being in here in this air-conditioned place on a hot New York day. I'm from Vermont, so I came down from my farm up there, which I'll talk about right now because I think it's relevant. So my father was a preacher, and every time he preached in front of the congregation, he always had a prop. And if I could bring a prop today, it would be, and forgive the graphic nature of what I'm about to say, it would be the horse poop from my farm because there's a teachable moment when the neighbor kids come over to my farm to help out with chores. And they see the horse poop and they see mushrooms growing out of the horse poop and they're fascinated by the fact that mushrooms are growing out of horse poop. Now it turns out that those mushrooms kill bacteria and may be useful to scientists in fighting off superbugs. How awesome is that? And it's such a great example of designing out waste and pollution and using waste to our benefit. Another good example, if you go up the Hudson River to the Black Rock Forest Consortium, I teach at NYU and we're a member of that consortium. I love to see New York City kids from the public school system see the compost toilets. So they go up and they use the toilets, then they come down and see where their poop just landed and it turns into soil that then is used to grow the gardens and the flowers at the Black Rock Forest Consortium. That's awesome. To be, able to, to be able to confront our waste and see it come to good and to some usefulness in society. That's a great example of circular economy. Now, I bring up poop, and hopefully that's okay. I couldn't actually bring poop today. Otherwise, I would have as a prop, like my father as a preacher did. Because we need to be able to come to terms with our waste. We assume if we just flush it, dump it, get rid of it, it will go away magically. Our state or our city will sell it to some other country, and they'll have to dispose of it, and then we've got likely an environmental justice issue. So we have to come to terms, and composting toilets are the, are the best visual example I know of in terms of educating the public about the opportunity here. So when I was looking through definitions of circular economy, I tested people in New York City. I would just walk up to people, my servers at a coffee shop or people on the street, and be like, do you know what a circular economy is? What kind of response do you think I got? Or when I, when I asked my family, and I have a pretty educated family, Hey, family, I won't mention the names of my family. I won't incriminate them here. Do you know what a circular economy is? Most people don't. So our work is tough ahead of us if we think about how to communicate the importance and the values and the benefits of a circular economy to the communities for whom we work and with which we work. I appreciate MacArthur Foundation's very simple three-point definition of a circular economy. Design out waste and pollution, keep materials and products in use, and regenerate natural systems. That's clear. I like that. I can say that to my family or I can say that on the street and people are like, okay, that makes sense. I'm going to repeat it because I'm a communications person. I love repetition. Design out waste and pollution, keep products and materials in use, i.e., don't get the latest iPhone, because we don't need it. I hope I don't get in trouble for saying that. Regenerate natural systems. So I'm going to use that as our definition going forward. There are many definitions. We've got incredible panelists who have their own definitions, and that's great. But I'm very keen to think about simple communication, efficient communication to the public. If you've walked around this space, or if you've gone to the bathrooms or used the water fountains, you'll see some of that communication happening, which I'll talk about. And you'll see that they're using health and economic benefits to get people to use tap water, not bottled water. To use the air dryer, not paper towels. They do have environmental benefits, ethical benefits too, but you'll see, and I saw, the economic and health benefits being the leading messaging, which I hope you employ as well as you talk to the publics about the benefits of a circular economy. Okay, so what happened this week? We have 12 years, according to IPCC, 
to turn this ship around to something more sustainable. What's incredible about the IPCC report this past week, which basically said we have 12 years and we have to have GHG emissions from 2010 levels, we have to triple renewable energy, the task ahead of us is urgent and it's dire and it's monumental. I love the fact that I could go up to a coffee shop in Vermont and the baristas were talking about the IPCC report with alarm to each other. Hey, do you know, do you know that we only really have until 2030 to fix this thing? Even Conan O'Brien, who in the US context is a comedian, tweeted and it got a ton of retweets and comments. Oh, I, I basically have 30 years left to live and so does the earth. You see a resonance in the publics now of the situation ahead of us, thanks to the IPCC report, that we have to reduce dramatically emissions, we have to ramp up renewable electricity dramatically, and you see the public talking about it. Now, how do we do that? That's what today is about. I also want to mention quickly my organization's work, the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance. This is the vanguard climate leadership among cities globally. We just produced in the last month, we released at the GCAS, Global Climate Action Summit in San Francisco, a Game Changers report to look at the seven ways cities can change the game systematically and structurally within their cities. So I encourage you to look at that. There are ample, myriad ways to fix, by 2030, the problems ahead of us. If you've read Paul Hawkins' Project Drawdown, he was one of the originators in this space with natural capitalism, thinking about the circular economy. So we know what to do. We know we need to switch off heavy meat consumption and plant-based diets. We know we need to switch from fast fashion to slow fashion. We know we need to reduce our family sizes. Multiple reports say that. So how do we do that? I'm gonna be interested in, and a lot of these panelists in panel one and two are engaging civil society. How do we promote the kind of behavior change, the cultural change that we need, so that it is cool to reuse a suit over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, like the one I'm wearing? Because currently it's still not cool to do that. Or to have one pair of dress shoes versus 20 or 30 pairs of dress shoes, because it's still not cool to do that. How do we make it cool to primarily consume plant-based diets? Because it's still not cool to do that. As a vegetarian, as a tall male, where there's plenty of cultural parameters around what a man should be or should not be, as a vegetarian for the last 20 years, and as someone who's chosen not to have kids, and as someone who used a lot of public transit, including in Los Angeles, which was very difficult 20 years ago, these activities are still not cool. How do we make it cool to reduce and reuse. Recycling, I think that's generally become cool. You can go to H&M, you can recycle your clothes, but how do we make it cool to not necessarily engage constantly in fast fashion, but instead in slow fashion, to wear your clothing 20 or 30 times versus the average seven times before you dispose it? So in thinking about behavior change and cultural change, what motivates people? Well, people are ultimately selfish, they think about themselves. So I brought up the tap water and the air dryer as examples because you'll see the marketing and messaging for behavior change out in the hallway have to do with selfish motivation to be healthier and to save money and save time. It doesn't necessarily always appeal to one's environmental ethics because we don't necessarily all share that, but we do share a desire to be healthy, I think. We do share a desire to save money, yes, and to save time. So as we think about this work in the circular economy and as we try to get people to design out waste and pollution, to keep materials and products in use, and to regenerate natural systems, how are we appealing to the publics and to policymakers in frames, messages, language that they get, they understand, and it's often health and economics and sometimes security? So I want us to think about that. I, as a communications director, I think about this stuff all the time, so forgive me for putting my bias into this conversation. We will talk about policies and platforms in the first panel, and then we will talk about partnerships in the second panel. All the while, I'm gonna be thinking about public engagement, and hopefully we can move the conversation in that direction. All right, so the panelists for the first panel were introduced. I'm gonna kick it off in order of the description in the program. Kevin DeCoupa, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much.